It's like when I'm alone with a guy and we're messing around and he gets all skittish about banging. So then I insinuate that it would be a shame if my account of what happened was different from his and then he ended up getting a call from the sheriff. You know what I mean? And then boom, we plow. We often hear that false allegations of crimes against women are extremely rare. An infographic from the Enliven Project from over a decade ago still regularly makes the rounds on social media, which purports that only 0.02% of men are falsely accused. In contrast, it claims that 14% of perpetrators are reported to the police, of whom only 2% face trial, and 1% are jailed for their crime. The rest of the men in this infographic are described as regardless. The Enliven infographic is far from alone in perpetuating this belief, though. A Google search of the prevalence of false reports will consistently reveal that the estimates lie between 2% and 10%, with many tending to focus on the smaller figure. Perhaps less responsible for the viral repetition of this number is Chief Crown Prosecutor for London, Alison Saunders, or the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which in 2013 claimed the number of false claims was 3%. These statistics have been circulating for so long that, for many, they have become common knowledge. But is there any validity to the notion that false claims are almost non-extant? In recent years, more and more people have come to question these numbers. If there were a singular moment in time that caused the biggest collective questioning of that statistic, it probably was the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, which illustrated to many how allegations could be used as weapons in a way not previously so transparent to the average person. However, the trend does remain in the zeitgeist. To illustrate what I mean, in early 2024, once respected YouTuber Mama Max, who gained fame as a hunter of predators, suffered a massive public downfall after he repeatedly demanded that other large YouTubers cover a case of a supposed vampire werewolf cult that, according to Max, had victimized, and I quote, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of minors. It was subsequently revealed that Max, who had named the supposed leader of this cult and encouraged his viewers to go after him, had no real evidence of these claims beyond the testimonies of a couple of women, one of whom was his childhood friend and was living with him at the time. My name is Spencer, and I am a survivor of Camden Gerard Davis, the leader of a destructive cult that has victimized hundreds of minors. This video is our screen for action. But also that his previous supposed investigations of alleged predators of women and children were largely, if not entirely, fabricated. That's the thing. So I want everyone, when you watch my video, to assume everything is fake, except, like, when I show up in face and what they're doing. Like, because obviously that's all real. And that's why we include, like, Mega Drive links to show, like, this is the full evidence. This is all real. Um, everything else should be considered fake, whether it's real or not, no. But have you ever gotten someone arrested? Um, if I have, then I don't know it. Why did you tell me he was arrested? You, you said Pablo Sonny was arrested in my video, did it? Why did you lie to me on my show? You have a clip of that? Yes. And then we pegged him. He fled to Mexico. We found where he was in Mexico. I don't know if the police asked him to come back or he went on his own volition or they forced him to come back. I don't know any of those details. I just know he went back to Canada and was in police custody for a certain amount of time. So you lied. And that apparently the lawyer advising him on the handling of this case was ChatGPT. ChatGPT understands the legal system. Like, okay. e even <laughs> if you're mean, you're joking with me. <laughs> Around the same time, another YouTuber, Savannah Marie, known for covering multi-level marketing schemes, released a video in which an alleged victim accused another YouTuber, Scammer Payback, of grooming and harassment. Scammer Payback, who had hired an adult woman to serve as a translator in his work on catching phone scammers, had his private messages with that woman released by her, with her constantly taking screenshots of the conversations while they were happening over the course of years, all during which she was encouraging the flirtatious behavior. While this obvious attempt at entrapment was not received well by viewers of the attempted expose of Scammer Payback, being a cheater but not a groomer, Savannah Marie simply called all of the criticisms victim-blaming. 
Although it seems through these claims that yes, the public is beginning to become more and more skeptical of any claim of harassment or abuse, the fact that so many are still so willing to do so is evidence of just how powerful socially, emotionally, and often financially these accusations can be for the accuser. And yes, myths about the rarity of false claims persist. Thus today, let's really dig into the data, as dirty and disgusting as the very subject matter may be, to actually understand and answer that question. Just how common are the claims of this nature that are ultimately unfounded? Before we continue, I need to make a few statements. First of all, the subject matter of this video may be disturbing. And although I will not describe anything illicit or in graphic detail, viewer discretion is advised. Despite that, not only to comply with YouTube's terms of service, but also to be sensitive to any potential victims who may be watching, I will be using acronyms to refer to certain criminal acts, namely SA. Finally, I'm going to sprinkle in some jokes and funny clips throughout this video to, frankly, make it watchable. Because for one, the subject matter is about as bleak as it gets. But for another, I do so as a function of instructional humor processing theory, which just means that it's easier to remember information when it's presented in a funny way. Please understand that I'm not making jokes to disrespect victims or downplay the severity of the crimes being discussed here, both against victims of SA and victims of false report, but rather because I want the video to be entertaining so people will actually watch it and will be able to remember the information that is included in this video. So take that into consideration. So with all of those caveats and warnings out of the way, let's get into the 2% myth. The history of false allegations of impropriety involving the carnal are likely as old as civilization itself. Because knowing the parentage of a child is of value both for men, knowing they have successfully passed on their genetics, and for women, knowing the father of her child and being able to rely upon him to care for her and the offspring, it makes sense why the particular type of assault in question is so deeply offensive to all of us. Not only because it is a violent act that strips its victims of agency and often leads to a lifetime of trauma, but because of a fundamental animalistic necessity below the sensibilities of our cogent minds to evidence. It is a bad evolutionary strategy for a case-selected species, such as humanity, whose children take an extraordinarily long amount of time to mature into adulthood compared to more R-selected species, such as rodents, to engage in either infidelity or in non-consensual intercourse. Whether it be fully a product of evolutionary psychology, a product of morals and ethics instilled in us from some outside source, or a combination of factors, one of the few things that pretty much everyone can agree upon is that SA is a sickening crime. It is because of the severity of the crime then that fabricating claims of its occurrence are similarly reviled and have been throughout the course of human history. For example, the biblical story of Joseph, Dreamcoat Joseph, not Big J's dad Joseph, whatever you believe about the factuality of the Bible, which tells an ancient morality tale of a false allegation of assault made against Joseph, a slave, after he continually rebuffed the advances of his owner's wife, an accusation for which Joseph was imprisoned, is evidence that this idea is not new. In modernity, unlike the severe and social legal actions that such a claim may have come associated with in biblical times, today the claimant rarely faces any repercussions for making them, with a few rare and very public exceptions, such as the case of Amber Heard. Of course, the reason why this is the case in our modern legal system is so that claimants need not fear that reporting an assault will result in their own punishment. However, this defense for victims can and does sometimes mean that yes, people will lie about being victimized. Of course, many feminists will argue that while this can happen, it happens so rarely that it's really not worth worrying about, often citing that 2% of reports are fabricated. A review of literature from criminologists Dr. John Savino and Dr. Brent Turvey from 2011 found no evidence, though, for such a figure and instead found that estimates in the academic literature of intentional false reporting ranged between 8% to 41%, which is an extremely broad estimate. Broads, am I right? Look, I'm, I'm trying to put some levity into an extremely depressing topic. Anyway, that makes sense due to the nature of the crime usually involving only two parties in a private setting. 
inherently making any allegations largely resolve around hearsay and witness credibility in any instance with a lack of physical evidence. It's possible, then, that nearly half of all allegations are false. But it's also possible that fewer than 1 in 10 are fabricated. The oft-touted 2% figure is a political slogan that is believed to have been derived from a speech a judge gave to some attorneys half of a century ago, although no one is exactly sure of its original source. It is not, however, a true representation of the prevalence of fabricated allegations. That extremely low 2% rate exists because it relies upon the basis that not only is the alleged criminal found to be not guilty, but also that the court is unable to definitively prove that the claims made are false. That is, it is not enough that the court finds the defendant not guilty. This 2% number also requires that, quote, the determination that a report is false must be supported by evidence that the assault did not happen. In other words, to reach this 2% number, one must prove a negative. The standard runs on Phoenix Wright rules. A report from Lisek et al. 2010 is likely one of the major, if not the primary source for the 2% figure. But even that is not what they found, nor should it be taken at face value. That 2% number has been a statistic banded about now for decades, but it's important we look at one of its most prominent modern sources that is often cited related to it, which again is Lisek et al., because it is truly miserable in its evidence. There are a few studies that Lisek et al. utilized before arriving at their 2% number, which, by the way, even they contend is only 2% at the lowest estimate, but potentially as high as 10%. Those being the Toronto Essay Study, the Philly Essay Study, the 1999 and 2005 British Home Office Essay Studies, a similar in scope to the Home Office Studies in Australia, and the Making a Difference or MAD study, in addition to their own research, driven by case summaries of every essay reported to an unspecified U.S. University Police Department over a 10-year period, between 1998 and 2007. I guess you could say that the majority of their data came under foreign affairs. Get it? Ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> well, that was a bad joke. Enjoy this completely unrelated image of Rotherham. The low end of the figure, that 2.1% specifically, comes from a report from the Australian Victoria Police using data collected between 2000 and 2003. The police determined in that particular assessment that 2.1% of cases were definitively false. But that's all I can tell you about that report. There is no working copy of this government document available online, so I have no way of being able to determine how the police arrived at that conclusion let alone any other information about that report beyond its abstract. For now, let's just assume, however, that it is accurate. And I say for now, with good reason. The second lowest statistic, 2.5%, is derived from a 2005 report from the London Home Office Research Development and Statistics Directorate, which drew their data from three SA referral centres, or SARCs, in Manchester, Northumbria, and West Yorkshire. These centers are third-party organizations that serve as a form of outsourcing for the police to coordinate with doctors and to conduct testing on purported victims. Reports from these groups were compared to the Met Police reports from Brent, Newham, and Thames Valley. Their analysis includes historic data from the St. Mary's Center database, case record tracking, including the presence of forensic reports and information regarding the taking up of any legal services, police statements, questionnaires given to those who had used the SARC services, interviews with SARC staff, audits of forensic medical reports, and a content analysis of witness and victim statements. They found that there were 216 cases classified as false allegations out of 2,643 police reports, indicating that 8% of reports were deemed false. Out of 1,817 reports, 12% did not proceed past the police report stage and were found false and in only 6% of these cases was anyone arrested in association with a false report. I read through the entire false report section of this giant document, and I genuinely have no idea where Lisek et al. drew the reported figure of 2.5% from. My best guess is that they confused the 12% false report rate and combined the 2 and the 12 with the 5% of cases wherein there was no evidence and then just deleted one of the numbers or something? I'm honestly baffled. Nowhere in this report can I find anything approaching 2.5%. It's 12% that are false and 5% that have no evidence. Where's the 2.5%?
Lisek et al. also cite a book from 1979 from McCahill that arrived at a 3% false report statistic that comes pretty close to that magic 2% figure. This book is not available online, and while I could have ordered a physical copy of it, those data are so old that I didn't think it worth investigating further, given the massive shift in culture and acceptance of feminism in the broader zeitgeist over the years. I would be willing to believe Lisek et al. that before 1979, perhaps the false report rate really was 3%. But they've illustrated to me that they appear to play a little fast and loose with what they claim other research evidences, made clear by their claim that the London Home Office report found 2.5% of cases to be false when it was actually 12%, which, by the way, would place one of their own sources above their supposed 2-10% to figure, and get used to that. So, frankly, I just don't believe them, and considering that I can't access that Australian 2000 to 2003 report, I'm also skeptical about the accuracy of that reporting. So what exactly did Lisek et al. do in their own research to contribute to this alleged 2 to 10% statistic? And I am focusing on Lisek et al. as heavily as I am, because I believe that this article is one of the primary sources for that 2% claim, given that it has over 500 citations making it one of the most cited papers on the subject matter. So, what did they do in their own research? Why they provided case summaries to two groups of, presumably, graduate students, but perhaps undergraduates, they don't clarify, meaning it could have been literally anyone. But they asked some people if they believed that the cases were fabricated. Academia is a field that supposedly relies upon expertise, and yet here appears to be reliant upon manufacturing consent for the public from a position of unearned power, expecting that no one, such as myself, would ever be able to expose their obfuscation nor lies by omission. Whoops. Going into the data themselves, the vast majority of reports were made by female university students, which is logical as women in college are known to do a lot of drinking and, given their age, be sometimes a bit naive around not just potential predators, but their own friends who likely are also intoxicated. Look, this is just my personal opinion, but I think that if two people are sauced up and both legal adults, claims of SA are typically going to be nearly impossible to evidence. However, they found via their totally legitimate analysis, using the opinions of two groups of students, perhaps, maybe homeless people, it's not actually clear, rather than the opinions of police, lawyers, and judges, that of 136 cases of SA that were assessed, 5.9% were false reports, 44.9% did not result in legal disciplinary action, 35.3% were referred for prosecution, and 13.9% were unclear cases in which the participants said they were unsure of their own feelings on the matter, according to the reports of a panel of, again, randos who were reviewing these cases. In total then, Lisa Goodall's own analysis concluded that 6% of reports were false, not 2%. There are a number of other studies that they cite that range from 7% to 10.9%, which they round down for some reason, rather than round up, as is the standard. The only thing of value that I think can be gleaned from this contemptible series of words and tables are the numbers themselves, which illustrate that the majority of assaults are committed by non-strangers, involve a single perpetrator, and largely concern students on a college campus, many but not all of whom are intoxicated. And that's it, dear viewer. At least, I think so. I think this paper, given its wealth of citation and the lack of more readily available data from the Australian government documents that aren't accessible, and a book printed in 1979, I think this ridiculous paper, that cannot even cite other data correctly, and involved some of the dumbest methodologies that I've ever come across, is the primary source of the 2% myth. A study drawing from data from the LAPD from Swan White and Tells 2014 came up with some pretty different numbers. These scholars examined 401 cases of alleged SA from female complainants over the age of 12 in 2008. They were given full access to these reports without redaction. The case files included the initial report from the officer who took the statements from the alleged victim, follow-up reports from the detective assigned to the case, witness statements, physical and forensic evidence, as well as the detective's rationale in determining that the case was baseless if that did end up being their decision. In addition, the scholars interviewed 52 LAPD detectives in 2010 for about an hour each regarding their decisions to unfound the allegations. These authors only considered a report to be unfounded if 
after thorough investigation that the complaint was intentionally fabricated or if the case was baseless on the auspices that the complainant may not have been intentionally lying but may believe themselves to be a victim despite a lack of forensic evidence, the presence of intoxicants, or witness statements that contradicted the claimant which resulted in the police determining that no crime had occurred. There were two types of cases that were not considered false reports by the authors. Those were in the complainant rescinded their complaint, but there was some evidence that the recanting was motivated by fear, social pressure, or a lack of interest from the complainant in pursuing criminal proceedings, or cases where the complainant did not rescind the complaint, but there was a belief that prosecution would likely be unsuccessful in securing a conviction due to the behavior of the complainant, either being non-compliant, lacking corroborating evidence, or inconsistencies in their story that were found by the detective. To clarify with an example of each type of report considered false, in one instance, a woman reported that she had been walking alone in the early afternoon when a man in a white van asked her if she needed a ride. After saying that she did and got into the car, the supposed suspect parked the car under a bridge, threatened her with a knife, and assaulted her. A story she relayed to her therapist and was encouraged to file as a police report. Upon traveling with the police to the bridge where the attack supposedly occurred, the officers noticed a security camera that would allow them to find the license plate of the perpetrator. At this point, the woman admitted that the encounter was consensual and that she had told her therapist otherwise in an attempt to garner sympathy. Thus, a case of recantation without evidence. In a case of the other type of false report, no recantation and lack of evidence, or evidence that the crime did not occur, a homeless woman living out of her Honda Civic claimed that she awoke to find two men in her car who had drugged and assaulted her and that they had done this several times before, but she had not reported the prior instances. A medical exam found no evidence of non-consensual activity, nor of her hypnol in her system. And police noted that it was highly unlikely that two grown men, one claimed to be 5 foot 11 and the other 6 foot 2, could have committed such a crime in the back of a compact car. Thus, a case without recantation, but unfounded via investigation. Cases that were unfounded and baseless but not intentionally fabricated, often involved the consumption of recreational drugs at a rave or a party, or instances where the complainant was found to be developmentally delayed to the point that they could not understand the very concept of SA. The authors only considered instances where it was either directly proven that the complainant was lying, or instances where the complainant may have believed a crime had occurred, but investigation could not provide any evidence for it. Everything else, including when the complainant recanted their claim, or when there was a lack of evidence or mitigating factors that would make the case impossible to prosecute were not considered false reports. So keep that in mind when we go into these findings. Even admitting that the claim was false was not considered a false report in this study. Of the 401 cases, 81 were unfounded by the LAPD, meaning 20% of cases were directly closed by the police for any of the aforementioned reasons, including the ones that the authors do not consider false reports. Even with this categorization, 14% of unfounded cases were found to be false because the victim recanted and there was no evidence or because there was no evidence of a crime or evidence indicating the crime absolutely did not occur, but the victim did not recant. An additional 1% were found to be baseless, but not fabricated intentionally or not. For the cases that were specifically found to be false, only 18% concerned reports of crimes outside of SA, including attempted SA and battery, which includes acts such as fondling or inappropriate contact. A quarter of the false reports claimed to have been attacked by a group rather than an individual, half claimed to have been victimized by a stranger, and three quarters alleged the assault was aggravated, that is, involving a weapon. These numbers immediately stand out as suspicious to anyone even slightly familiar with statistics on the perpetrators of SA. Data from RAIN, the largest nonprofit organization in the US dedicated to aiding victims of SA, and whose acronym I can't read out loud on YouTube and still have any chance of monetization, reports that 19.5% of assaults are committed by strangers, 11% were aggravated, and only 6% were committed by more than one person. Svon White and Tells argue that it may be that complainants who file false reports feel that they need to create a story that aligns with stereotypes about SA rather than the realities of most instances of SA. 
which tend to be committed by a single perpetrator familiar to the victim and without the use of a weapon. Some final takeaways from Swan et al's regression analysis are that the most common reason that the police unfounded an allegation was victim recantation, as only 7% of the 55 that were recanted were not unfounded by the authorities, those largely being cases where the police believed that the claimant had been coerced or threatened to recant. Unfounding was more common in claims of assault by a stranger, for the aforementioned reasons, three times more common when there were concerns with the claimant's character or reputation, and 10 times more common when the claimant had a mental illness. In summation then, even excluding all cases where the police could not find evidence that a crime had definitively not occurred, 20% of instances of reported SA in the LAPD system were ruled as false, either because the victim admitted to lying or because there was no evidence whatsoever that the crime had not occurred. At an absolute minimum, the rate is 14% according to data from the LAPD. That's a pretty robust and I would say fair way of trying to come to some precise statistic that still gives a wide berth for potential victims who simply don't have any evidence. While Swan et al. did find that the vast majority of reports are not unfounded by the police, their estimates are between 2 and 10 times the prevalence of false report according to Lisek et al. and the commonly touted 2% statistic. We just spent a good deal of time going over some actual research from Swan et al., which I wanted to focus on not only because it's interesting, but because people, including other academics, often like to misinterpret their findings. What I have described here are the unweighted findings. However, Svan et al. weighted their data by the proportion of cases from each division and within each division, as well as the proportion of cases from each case closure type, by which they arrived at the conclusion of 4.5% of reports being false. But it reads as a bit disingenuous to me to run with this 4.5% statistic, when without weights, it's between 14 and 20%. That doesn't stop other scholars from repeating this nonsense such as was the case with Ferguson and Malouf, 2015, who conducted a small meta-analysis on the subject and reported that 4.5% from Svan, rather than digging deeper into the data, seemingly having skimmed the entire piece, if not having just read the abstract alone. That's less than undergraduate level work. My guy, what are you doing? But wait, it gets worse because they also include unpublished data gained via, as they say, quote, personal correspondence with another supposed academic. In other words, an anecdote. Two of the studies used were from the 1970s, and while I have often made the argument that when we're talking about things in the social sciences that we don't believe would have changed significantly over time because they concern human nature rather than culture, then it's probably okay to use old data. However, public perceptions concerning what is SA and criminal investigations have changed vastly in that time span. They also use a report from the Australian Office of Women's Policy that's no longer available as far as I can tell, so I cannot confirm nor deny the findings from that study. The final study used in Ferguson and Maloff's meta-analysis, and I'm using the term meta-analysis here hesitantly, that is recent as to the time of their publication, is a report from the UK Home Office's Research Development and Statistics Directorate from Kelly et al. 2005 which drew from two SA referral centers, or SARCs. 3,172 reports were made to SARC, and of those, 2,643, or 72% of claimants, went on to report the issue to the police. Of those, 1,817, or 69%, God, why did it have to be that number? And 57% of the reports made to SARC did not move further into the legal process for a variety of reasons. 12% of claims were stopped after reporting it to the cops because it was classified by the police as false. 8% of cases that were later deemed false proceeded to legal action beyond the reporting phase. Of the reports that did not continue past the reporting phase, 21% were dropped due to insufficient evidence. 17% were withdrawn by the alleged victim, and another 17% because the alleged victim did not complete the process. 13% because the offender could not be identified, 2% because there was no prospect of conviction, 1% because of a lack of public interest in the case, and the remaining 12% for some other or unknown reason. The majority of cases, 52%, that were designated as false 
were made by complainants between the ages of 16 and 25. A larger percentage of them were unemployed than they were employed. False claimants were more than twice as likely to have some sort of disability. And of those, 80% had a mental health issue specifically. Only 53 claimants, just 2%, admitted to the police that the allegations were false, and of those, 33 provided explanations for why they made the false claims. Of those, 75% were made for the purpose of covering something up. Most commonly, infidelity. Then hiding a relationship from one's parents, then investigations of fraud or theft, and only one case in which the claim was made to hide a tryst with the adult claimant's father-in-law. Only 8.25% admitted that they made the false claims for the purpose of revenge and gave a number of rationales. Revenge against a difficult neighbor, against an ex-partner who refused to leave his new partner, against an ex-partner who had previously allegedly engaged in forced acts but not in the instance that was reported to the police, to make an ex-partner feel sympathetic, or against a man only interested in a one-night stand with a supposed victim. 145 cases escalated beyond police report, but not to trial, representing only 6% of the total sample, and were directed to the Crown Prosecution Service, which advises the UK police and other investigatory agencies regarding whether or not a suspect should face criminal charges. An organization I suspect rarely gets a moment of rest, given what I know about the Metropolitan Police. I'm a full-on rapist, you know? Um, Africans, dyslexics, children, that sort of thing. 50% of cases were forwarded and were pending trial, but of the other half, in 6% of cases, the alleged perpetrators were given a caution or reprimand without legal action. 26% of cases were discontinued by the CPS, 17% of cases were resolved in a withdrawal from the claimant, and in 1% of cases, the suspect had fled from the authorities and could not be located. The third group from this data set actually did go on to trial, 322 cases and represented 14% of the full sample. Of those that were set to go to trial, a similar percentage of cases resulted in both guilty pleas and acquittals, with 32% being acquitted and 28% pleading guilty. 20% were convicted of the charge. 6% were withdrawn at court, 5% were withdrawn by the victim, 5% were somehow unclear if the case resulted in a conviction or had included a guilty plea, 3% resulted in partial conviction, and only 1% had to be rearranged due to the suspect having fled trial. In total then, about a third of cases reported to the police do not proceed to any legal or formal action, and the most common reason for that is because there was insufficient evidence. The claimant withdrew their complaint or declined to work with the police throughout the process, just in order of frequency, and then because the claim was actively deemed false by the police, followed by a complete lack of evidence of any assault. Out of the two-thirds of people who contacted the SA Referral Center in the UK for help, only a third went on to actually report that complaint to the police. And of those, 80% never got further than a police report. And then, for those who did go forward in filing a police report, 12% of them were deemed false. 5% had no evidence of assault. 21% had to cease due to a lack of evidence. 17% ended because the victim did not follow through with the court system, and 17% ended with the victim withdrawing the case, the latter of which may be because the victim was being pressured or threatened, to be fair. Going back to Ferguson and Malif's meta-analysis, this is the only additional study that is either not from the 1970s, publicly available, or not one of the two studies that we've already discussed. And yet they report the false claim rate as falling between 2.5% and 7%. Now, in order to arrive at the 7%, yeah, I can at least figure that one out mathematically when you include only the 216 confirmed false reports versus the 3,172 calls made to Sark. That's 6.8%. If you include the instances where there was absolutely no evidence though, that increases to 9.4%. If we again include cases where there was insufficient evidence, this increases significantly to 21.5%. That's a fair ways away from that 2% number. But again, that statistic comes from the initial reports to Sark, not reports to the police. If we instead include intentional falsity, which is 12% of police reports, and then add in cases with no evidence, then we are at 17% of all reports. And 
Then if we add in cases with insufficient evidence, we are at 38% of all cases filed with the police. So where did that 2.5% number, or more accurately from Kelly et al's reporting used by Ferguson and Malif's 3% number come from? Well, Kelly et al argued that by combing through the police reports that were deemed false, and instead focusing only on cases that were unquestionably false and not probably false, based on their own opinions, by the way, then that percentage diminished to 3%. Well, what's the percentage that ended up in that meta-analysis? It's 3%. As the old saying goes, there are lies, damned lies and statistics. And in reading this research, the origin of that aphorism is becoming increasingly obvious to me. Can one manipulate data to try and reach that desired, seemingly holy number of 2-3% false accusations of which scholars like Ferguson and Maloff will only take the lowest estimate of only to further dilute the well of data to create a false public perception of a trend that is not evidenced by the raw data when taking the totality of information into account? Clearly, they can. And it's because of academics like Lisak, Ferguson and Maloff, amongst plenty of others, that the public ends up with the commonly touted idea that 2% of claims are false is ingrained into the collective mindset. But that simply is not the case. Hundreds of academics are willing to cite these works, either because they're lazy or because they are politically motivated, and they continue to do so. A more recent study of cases that were deemed unfounded by officers cleared or cleared by exceptional means from Venema, Lorenz, and Sueda, 2021, from a sample of over 23,000 cases of criminal SA, or CSA, criminal, not child, reported to a Midwestern police department between the years of 1999 and 2014 in victims over the age of 13 can provide us with more information. A case is considered to be cleared when the police investigation into the matter is closed, either by arrest, unfounding, or by exceptional means, wherein the suspect is identified and located, but the case was not pursued for a variety of reasons, including the victim refusing to go forward with prosecution or the case not being strong enough for prosecution. As mentioned before, cases that have been unfounded by the police are those for which there is not sufficient evidence to process it as CSA, either because it is baseless due to a lack of evidence or found to be falsified. Other variables, including if the alleged victim had been drinking, injured, if a weapon had been used, if there was a witness present, the relationship between the victim and suspect, and the sex and race of the detective in charge of all of these cases were assessed. Recall that these were only cases that were formally reported to the police. And of the 23,525 cases in the total sample, 49.7% were either open, suspended, or other, leaving the other 50.3% to fall into the categories that we're interested in here today. Of those, 12,661, comprising 15.9%, were unfounded, 13.2% were cleared, and 24.8% were exceptionally cleared. The majority of the cleared cases resulted in arrest and prosecution, with the remaining 0.3% from the total sample being referred to juvenile court. Of those exceptionally cleared, most were cases where the victim refused to prosecute the case, 16.6% .6 of the total sample, with 8.2% of the total falling into other exceptional categories. Finally, 15.9% were declared unfounded. Male victims, older victims, and victims that did not report the incident within 72 hours were more likely to be determined as being unfounded. Additionally, the victim having been drinking, having no witnesses, having no injuries, the absence of a weapon, and the parties being involved in some former ongoing romantic relationships, all related to increased propensity for the case to be unfounded. In totality, 16% of cases were unfounded, which again includes instances that were baseless and potentially intentionally falsified. These were only cases that were not only reported to the police in the first place, but also where the police dropped the case, not ones where the legal action outside of police work was similarly dropped for all kinds of reasons, be it because the victim themselves dropped the case, or because of a lack of evidence, or even falsified evidence. What I think is of most import to be aware of in all of the studies that we've looked at here is that these are concerning only police report and or going further in terms of legal action. Not someone making claims on social media without any involvement of the authorities. It's all too easy to just throw out a claim into the ether. It's a bit harder to make a report to the police, and even harder 
to take that claim to court. Which makes sense. But even so, it does seem that the number of cases that are unfounded due to being baseless or falsified is far above that mythical 2% statistic. So let's look at research that's a little bit less disingenuous and try to get at the real numbers. Anyone being serious and not trying to cook the books knows that the number of false reports far exceeds 2%. And that said number can only be reached by holding claimants to a standard of being found guilty in a court of law, when as we've seen, most cases don't go past a police report and a significant number don't even make it to the cops. Unless it's the Met, in which case the cops get to victims if we're the criminals do. I'm a big man. I can help you. Nobody messes with me. You'd be my princess. So, given that we've discovered where that 2% figure comes from, let's look elsewhere. For example, Jordan 2004 examined a sample of 164 criminal files from the New Zealand police, where the complaint was cleared as no offense disclosed, aka unfounded complaints, and those which the police classified as a reported offense but had ceased investigating, either because there was insufficient evidence or because the complainant withdrew the allegation. The police determined that, of the types of cases that Jordan requested access to, 21% were genuine reports, of which 8% did proceed forward to prosecution after the cessation of police investigation. 8% were unable to proceed because no offender was detected, 2% were able to identify the offender, but the police determined that it was not actionable in court. And 8% were instances where the police believed the complaint was true, but the complainant withdrew from prosecution. As previously mentioned, many of these cases of withdrawal could be a result of intimidation or coercion. In one example of these genuine cases supplied by Jordan, a woman reported that she had met up with a friend of her boyfriend while at a bar, asked to crash at his apartment, and woke up to him assaulting her. She withdrew her complaint after the alleged perpetrator's lawyer warned the claimant of the potential consequences that she might face going forward and the effect that a jury trial could have on her life. The police officer in charge of her case stated that he believed her story, but she withdrew it anyway. Look, I'm just reading this as a text report. So while it sounds to me like a pretty dubious allegation to say the least, clearly something that this woman said to the officer convinced him that she was telling the truth, thus it was filed as a genuine instance of SA. 62 out of the 164 cases assessed, or 38%, were instances where the police were unable to determine if the complaint was true or not due to a lack of available evidence, inconsistencies or irregularities in the claimant's testimony, or because the complaint had been made on behalf of the victim by someone else, despite the alleged victim not desiring police involvement, the latter of which comprised 8.5% of the total sample. Again, there's any number of reasons that someone might tell a friend that they have been victimized, yet not want the police to get involved, including coercion or intimidation, or on the other hand, because the claim really was false and was made for any variety of reasons, which we will examine more later. Of the cases that fell into this category in Jordan's analysis, one came from a woman who had recently broken up with her boyfriend and then gotten drunk and high with a male friend. And, well, things proceeded as you might imagine they would. After this evening, she went about her life seemingly though as normal for several days before reporting to the police that the male friend had initiated intercourse with her while she was unconscious. However, upon further review of her complaint, she admitted that it was her ex-boyfriend with whom she wanted to get back together with who encouraged her to file the complaint and that she was really just annoyed that the male friend continued to have sex with her after she asked him to stop, which, yes, could be S.A., but it doesn't sound like it in this instance, at least to me. And it's intriguing that this case sounds nearly identical to the one that the police believed to be true, but that only illustrates the nuance of such cases. When claimants change their story, it makes it difficult for the police to get to the truth of an allegation such as another case where a sex worker reported that she had been abducted and SA'd, and while she maintained that she had been abused, she later admitted that it was not a client, but instead her pimp, whose identity she did not wish to reveal to the authorities. Other factors that influence the believability of a potential crime from these police reports are the use of drugs or alcohol and potential psychiatric issues, both of which can cause problems with memory. Of course, given that the victims of SA are more often than not women, 
it makes sense why the police have to calibrate for potential mental health concerns. If you catch my drift. Goodbye, rationality. Will I ever see you again? I'm afraid not. You can't have both. Goodbye. Goodbye, rationality. Goodbye. Maybe something violative did happen, but if the victim is mentally unwell or intoxicated, it's hard for the police to make a strong case that it did. A total of 55 cases, 33% of the sample, were determined by the police to either be definitively false, 17.6%, or almost certainly false given that the police were already suspicious of the claims and then the victim withdrew the claim, 16%. In over half, 55% of the cases where the police believed the claim to be false, the claimant was intellectually or psychologically disturbed, many of whom tended to file multiple claims against different men or repeated claims against the same man. One potential issue with the tendency for police to dismiss and falsify claims made by repeat claimants is that it is possible that someone can be victimized by multiple partners or by the same partner multiple times, yet still get lumped in with the mentally unwell, vindictive, or greedy claimants. Especially if they can't run very fast, like me and probably a lot of my ancestors, to be fair. The final and smallest category for obvious legal reasons are cases where the complainant admitted to the police that the claim was false, comprising just 8% of the full sample. These were cases where the claimant told the police that Either the sex had been consensual, that there had been no sexual contact, or that they had fabricated the allegations for personal reasons. As a recap, Jordan's data indicated that in total, 41% of filed instances of SA that were no longer being investigated by the New Zealand police were false, either as determined by the police or admitted to by the claimant. That is a far cry from 2%. Maybe if you include all the sheep on the island, those numbers would make more sense. But otherwise, I'm not sure how one circles those squares without someone playing silly buggers with their data. An incredibly detailed study from the southwest of England, which assessed 379 cases of SA or attempted SA of victims of both sexes, curiously the first time we've seen male victims even included in any reporting in this review, over the age of 16 between 1996 and 2000 from Leah Lambers and Shaw 2003, also paints a very different picture from the feminist and pop armchair psychology dogma of the 2% false report statistic. Of the 379 cases, 84.7% were reported as SA of a female, 10% of attempted SA of a female, and only 5% the attempted, not completed, SA of males. 78% of reportants were under the age of 35, and 66% described themselves as single at the time of the event. Out of all categories, the majority, 33% of claimants, were unemployed or dependents. As the age of the victim increased, somewhat interestingly, so too did the age of the perpetrator, 58% of whom were single and 41% of whom were unemployed. Reports of assault were made more commonly on the weekend, predictably, as it tends to be when people are out drinking, doing drugs, and, well, other crimes. <laughs> Today is fine day in California. Huh? Most claims, 62%, occurred within the home rather than in a public place with 30% reported in the home of the complainant, 17% in the home of the accused, and 15% in a shared home of the two parties. Comparatively, 4% occurred in a car, 6% took place in a private place outside of the home, such as a friend's house, and 28% in a public place such as a nightclub or an alleyway. Younger victims reported being more likely to have been attacked in a public place, and in 37% of all cases the perpetrator was described as a stranger. Something that we know to be a bit wary of, but hang on with me because before we get to the outcomes, there are some important details that we should understand in order to get a better view of the totality of these data. In 10% of cases, the assault occurred after having accepted a lift or an invitation home from the accused, 8% after accepting a mutual walk, and a surprisingly low 2% after accepting a drink from the alleged perpetrator at a bar. The overwhelming majority 95% of cases involved a single perpetrator and involved PIV intercourse. Somewhat fascinatingly, even in this 2003 report, they included what they called digital penetration as part of their 4% figure of violation and not involving the use of, uh, the male part. Wait, oh. Oh, that's what digital penetration means. Okay, yep, uh, makes sense why that was happening in 2003. Okay, gotcha. My bad. Anyway, in 71% of the cases, the victim reported no threats made outside of the act itself, 
and 46% reported no violence even in regards to the act. However, when violence was threatened, it was more likely to be enacted. In total then, 38% of cases were dropped either because the victim retracted the allegations or because she refused to assist the police in the case. As I've said before, there is always the possibility that victims retract their allegations or do not work with the police because they are being coerced or threatened. And in fact, in 50% of these cases, the police did suspect that that might be the case. However, if we take that police estimate into consideration, then still, 19% of alleged victims retracted their case for some reason other than threats or coercion. These also aren't just guesses by the officers, as there was a significant relationship between there being an ongoing partnership between the victim and the perpetrator and the case being dropped with no further action taken compared to cases where the victim either did not know the perpetrator or in which their relationship had ended. I also cannot overstress that me pointing out these statistics and being critical about them is in no way blaming victims of both abuse and coercion. But at some point, we have to be clinical and mathematical, not emotional, even while respecting the experiences of real victims. At some point, we need to be scientific. That all being said, in 10% of instances, the police determined that claims made by an alleged victim were false and in another 10%, the alleged victim admitted to having fabricated the complaint. An additional 3% of cases did not proceed because the claims of the alleged victims were deemed inconsistent due to the claimant having mental or psychiatric issues and thereby were unable to be verified. Ignoring the mental illness instances, that leaves us at 20% of allegations being false. Perhaps the victims said their reports were false out of fear, true, but if we take that same percentage of police, 50% who believe that the withdrawals were coerced and then apply them to the far more serious legal situation of a supposed victim admitting to having falsified the claim, even then, we end up with 15% of reports being false, and if we then add in the claims that are dropped, including the 50% coercion rate, we're at 34% of all claims being false or retracted for some reason other than coercion or threat. That's a third. This is me being as fair as possible via the data that we have available. It's not 2%, it's somewhere between 19 and 34% at the lower end of the estimate, and between 20 and 58% at the higher end of the estimate. If you want to throw half of the cases dismissed out of mental illness into that number, then it's about 60% of all cases falsified. I want to be clear. I am not saying 60% of all allegations of SA are false. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that using the same kind of definitional dickery and statistical silliness that the 2% folks make, one could easily take academic research and claim something approaching two thirds of all allegations of SA are false. Do you see why it is so important to pay very close attention to how statistics are presented? Because if I were a disingenuous actor with some political agenda that I cared about more than academic honesty, I certainly could have just presented these data to you differently. Dear viewer, I could have led you to the conclusion that 60% of allegations are fake just from this one piece of research, but I refuse to do so. An older study from Canon 1994 worked with a police department in a small unnamed Midwestern town with about 70,000 residents to examine the outcomes of investigations into allegations of SA over a nine-year period. Due to the relative tiny nature of the community, the local PD were not given discretion to refuse investigation into any claim of SA, no matter how suspicious the alleged victim's claims may be. Additionally, both parties in a dispute were given an opportunity to submit themselves for a polygraph test in this district. This is a simple lie detector. I'll ask you a few yes or no questions and you just answer truthfully. Do you understand? Yes. In this instance, the department only declared a complaint to be definitively false if the claimant admitted that it was false, not if the department determined that it was meritless. Further, these data did not include allegations of attempted SA, but rather only allegations of completed SA. Over the nine years, 45 out of the 109 or 41% of all reports were declared, again, by the complainant to have been fabricated. A number, if you have noticed, identical to the total number identified as false from Jordan's data from 10 years later. Year by year, 
the incident rates ranged from 27% to 70%. A replication of Cannon's research from Kennedy and Witowski, 2000, conducted in a suburb of Detroit, found a lower but comparable false report rate of 32% between 1988 and 1997. I can't go into more detail about that particular report because it is locked behind ProQuest, which only people with active university accounts can access. Very cute, by the way. Thus, I am citing the information secondhand from Turvey and McGrath, 2011. From everything that I have seen and read, I would say that the actual likely occurrence rate of false accusations of SA lies somewhere between 8% and 41%, which is so wide of a gap as to be functionally useless. It's also the statistic that Turvey and McGrath arrived at in their own review and based on the research that we've looked at here today. For the sake of argument, let's throw in those silly 2% estimates. And we're now sitting at false reporting falling somewhere between almost never and almost half of all allegations, broadly speaking. How anyone could look at the wealth of research on this subject and publish something as disingenuous as the Enliven Project's graph, which to this day gets circulated around on social media as unquestionable proof and fact, is patently absurd. Scholars like some, but clearly not all of these that we've looked at, seem to have a point to make, hence their adherence to that 2% statistic, even when it makes no sense from their own data and selection of data from their reports. If you care about politics and not science or truth, well, then you wouldn't want to cite studies from the likes of Jordan 2005 or Leia Landvers and Shaw 2003 or Cannon 1994 or Kennedy and Wachowski 2000 and instead just keep citing over and over and over again the couple of papers that play silly buggers with the data in order to bolster your existing world view, not science, not fact, politic. Academics like Lisek et al., Svon et al., or Ferguson and Maloof are very clear to only ever judge claims proven false without a shadow of a doubt to be false in a court of law as false, and then take from those cases and subtract as much as possible using some data manipulation, or excuse me, probability estimates based on little more than feelings, or at least that's how it looks to me. I tend to believe a more reasonable perspective, and again, this is my perspective, so feel free to disagree with me here in the comments, would be to at least include the number of cases for which there are no evidence, insufficient evidence, and even victim withdrawal as important statistics to keep in mind when making claims about the actual prevalence of false allegations. But a ton of these cases never go to court or even beyond a police report if they even get that far. And plenty of them simply have no evidence, in which case it is absolutely impossible to say whether or not the report is false. So, how do we determine the truth in these cases? If the data are all over the place, then what can we rely on to give us an idea of whether or not an allegation is true or false? particularly given that not all claims are reported to the police, and few claims move beyond police report into legal action. Well, for some answers, we can look to Rassen and Vandersleen, 2005, who contacted Dutch police officers and asked them to review two recent sexual offenses, one of which was almost certainly true, and one of which had been proven to be false. They received 88 reports, 37 regarding the true allegations and 51 of the false allegations. Of the 37 true allegations, 27 ended in the conviction of the perpetrator, and 14% of the 51 false allegations resulted in a conviction of the supposed victim who had made the false claim. Only the cases that resulted in conviction were assessed further using a checklist of 43 aspects of the case to compare and contrast true accusations versus false accusations. Looking at just a few of the significant differences, Previous instances of interpersonal conflict with the alleged perpetrator was absent in 77.8% of the true allegations and present in 71% of the false allegations, indicating that false allegations are perhaps more likely to be a product of revenge than a crime. In true cases, typically the report was the first allegation made by the victim, while in false cases the claimant was more likely to have made multiple allegations in the past and in every single instance made more allegations in the future. 
as one would expect, in every one of the cases that were proven to be true, the crime scene was found. Further, true cases tended to have a plethora of forensic evidence, and their testimony tended to align with the presence of wounds, while this was not so in cases found false. True cases tended to report one perpetrator, while false cases tended to report multiple perpetrators. True reporters were able to describe the perp in detail, while false reporters were significantly less able to do so. There were several differences in the behavioral patterns between the two types of claimants concerning interactions with law enforcement, as actual victims were less likely to make allegations immediately, say that they fiercely resisted the assault, present with behavioral problems, take the lead in police interviews, be egocentric, be indifferent towards wounds or damage towards their bodies. Testicular torsion casters are always acting tough, right until a wizard casts! Mend! But crap! You rapscallion! I was so peggable before! Ha! Change statements in response to criticism, admit to memory issues or doubt their own statements, describe unusual or irrelevant details, reference their own thoughts, or presume the thoughts of the perpetrator, and overly describe sensory information. In contrast, false claimants had never contacted the National Fraud Investigation to report their claim, while true claimants had. False claimants were less likely to be critical of their own role in the crime, admit to having engaged in foreplay, have contextually appropriate behavior when dealing with the police, describe a realistic scenario, seem to have spontaneous and ill-prepared statements, have a clear chronology of events, including spatial information about the crime scene and the appearance of the perpetrator, and generally were just less clear overall. Despite the numerous differences, some items shared some significant patterns of overlap, which may be indicative that false claimants are aware of some aspects of SA that are common and realistic that they include in their statements in an attempt to make their story sound more real. However, for most truth indicators, there was a fairly broad difference between the behavior and testimony of a false claimant versus a true claimant. To summarize some of the major findings though, actual victims tend to be able to describe the events in detail without exaggeration, not have made previous similar allegations in the past, and even admit to possibly being partially responsible for what happened, which may be why they tend to be more likely to wait before reporting the event. False claimants, on the other hand, tend to focus on their feelings rather than facts, catastrophizing their descriptions as much as possible while avoiding any notions of personal responsibility. I want to emphasize that just because someone has made an allegation that sounds overwhelmingly egregious, involving weapons and multiple perpetrators, yet with little specificity or clear descriptions, while also denying any accountability and acting in an outgoing, overly emotional or bizarre and maybe even inconsistent manner, does not mean definitively that that claimant is lying. However, when put all together, it probably should raise an eyebrow as to the veracity of their claims. A perhaps perfect example of a false claimant following almost every single one of these trends is Amber Heard, whose story was riddled with inconsistencies, including outlandish claims of physical violence with nothing to show for it, admitted to little to no mutual abuse, and generally just sounded more like a movie script than reality. It's why the phrase, believe all victims, is absurdist, because not all victims are victims. A better way to describe how we should handle allegations instead, then, is that we should listen to all alleged victims, because when you listen to the things that someone claiming to be a victim really has to say when describing their victimization, they will often give themselves more than enough rope to hang their claims by. Again, this does not apply to all instances, but it is something to keep in mind. Specifically, Dr. Savino and Turby provide a list of red flags for investigators to be aware of when dealing with accusations of assault. Those being, number one, women, just kidding. But for real, number one, initiation of the report or pressure to report by someone other than the complainant herself. For example, a spouse, parents, intimate partner, friend, coworker, supervisor, hospital staff, etc. Unless the victim is unable to report or is too young to represent him or herself. Two, the complainant is unable to say where the sexual assault occurred or locate it even when pressed, when nothing would appear to prevent her from being able to do so, for example, no blindfold, no drugs, or alcohol to impair memory. Three, a vague description of the attacker is provided when descriptions of other parts of the crime are more detailed. 
4. While able to discuss details before and after the alleged assault, the complainant avoids answering specific questions about the attack by crying hysterically, becoming angry without provocation, or engaging in other deflective behaviors. 5. The complainant appears to be interested in something other than reporting the SA. For example, change in housing, disability payments, attention, or lawsuits. 6. The report of the SA serves to provide as an alibi of some kind. 7. Reconstruction of the physical evidence is at odds with the story of the victim. For example, a lack of defensive injury when a significant struggle is reported, the attacker is reported to have broken in through windows that are screwed or painted shut, damage or evidence transfer to the complainant's clothing is not present, with the reports of pulling, dragging, or tearing. 8. Injuries sustained by the complainant are consistent with known patterns of self-inflicted injuries. That's what Marky Mark does. He does that. And then, um... Oh, shit. And then the cops come in and he gets... Oh, and then the police think that William he Peterson, the guy from CSI... Go. She means business. Oh, she means business. Shit. <laughs> 9. The complainant's details are similar to information seen commonly in movies and or on television. For example, abduction on a busy street by masked suspects via a van. So, with this information in mind, and knowing what kind of red flags to be aware of when differentiating real cases from false ones, it's time to finally ask the question, why? Why do people lie about having been attacked in one of the most horrific and violative ways imaginable? And who tends to lie about such a crime? What I believe we need to understand in more detail, which we've discussed somewhat already, is this. Why make false accusations at all? For Potiphar's wife, who accused Joseph in the biblical tale, her reasoning was revenge against the young man for rejecting her romantic advances. In addition to revenge, Savino and Turvey identified several reasons why one might make a false report, including profit, be it the result of a lawsuit or in the form of sympathy and charity from others, crime concealment, either by lying about the true perpetrator of the act in order to protect them from punishment, or by claiming to be a victim of abuse when a suspect in another criminal act in an attempt to deflect blame, concealment of illicit activities, describing consensual behavior as non-consensual after the fact to hide one's complicity in the act, and mitigation of responsibility, which similarly to concealment of impropriety, refers to situations wherein any criticism of the individual is deflected from them by claiming victim status. The final reason for false report is mental defect, in which cases a fabricated claim is made either as a cry for help or because of mental illness that could produce false or inaccurate memories. The latter was perhaps the case for Catherine M. Clifton, who accused her college professor of abuse, only for her lawyer to say in court, after investigators found absolutely no evidence to substantiate her claims, that her bizarre behavior, including forging the signature of a judge to show as evidence to her friends and fellow classmates that she had won her case at court, was because Clifton had in fact been assaulted by her grandfather when she was just a child. Her grandfather was actually convicted of the crime that she had levied at her professor. More egregious, however, is the case of Audrey Sealer, who claimed that she had been abducted by a strange man, only to later be caught on security cameras buying the rope with which she would tie herself up, leaving herself to be found four days later, after she reportedly went missing, and blamed her actions on, quote, severe depression. Sounds like a bunch of fetish shit to me. Excuses aside, and although we have a basic idea of the general rationales for making false complaints, we should know which are the most prevalent which we can learn by looking to a paper from O'Neill et al. 2015, who conducted a qualitative review of the complex reasons for false allegations of SA, drawing from 55 cases reported to the LAPD in 2008. These were limited to reports of a crime that had been determined by the police to not have occurred. Of course, this was in 2008, and there was a lot of violation going on, particularly fiscal, but I digress. Multiple motives were understandably the most common, but of the specific motives, the most frequently reported was attention or sympathy, which was broken down into two types, personal, 9% of the total sample, or medical, 31% of the total sample. 22 cases involved making accusations for the purpose of either providing an alibi, 16%, or avoiding other criminal allegations, 23.6%. The next most common reason was mental illness, reported in 33% of cases, then anger or revenge, reported in 23.6% of cases, then regret or guilt, reported in 13% of cases. 
then the incident not being able to be classified as essay, 9%, and finally the complainant claiming that they never made an essay accusation, present in just under 4% of reports. While there are multiple reasons for fabricating a report of essay, the most common then is avoiding personal accountability for some offense, be it relational or criminal. Got caught fooling around with the pool boy? Well, it's probably easier to attempt to avoid personal responsibility by claiming that you were attacked rather than admit to consensual infidelity. However, and this is speculative on my part, but it seems that the cases that most commonly get the public's hackles up are those where the allegations appear to be motivated by greed, malice, attention-seeking, or unrequited love, rather than false memories, crime concealment, or mental illness. Well, why do you have a bunch of, like, weird tools in a hidden compartment in your car? It's fetish! It's fetish! I, 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 I like to bind! I like to be bound! I got... I, that's not important! Don't ask me questions! Evidenced as the entire world seemingly aligned in a rare moment of harmony to all collectively agree that Amber Heard was guilty of trying to destroy Johnny Depp's career, likely for a mixture of at least two of those reasons, greed and malice, if not also attention. Although we all know how that backfired in her face. However, that infamous case is far from isolated. Paraphrasing from a report from Goodyear Smith 2022, in the 1990s, the government of New Zealand instituted a program to award a flat $10,000 to anyone who claimed to have been a victim of SA, even in instances where the accused abuser was acquitted of the crime in court. Well, friends, how do you think that played out? It's four Fs. I didn't know it was gonna come off like that. The outcomes of this program were predictable. As well, between 1987 and 1988, there were 221 claims of SA that soared to 13,000 claims and cost the government 43.55 million in payouts. Although claims dropped over time, it's pretty telling that directly after the Kiwi government promised money to citizens no matter the legal outcome of their case, that reports of SA exploded. In 2012, Natalie Mortimer accused her grandfather of having abused her in her youth, only to later admit that she was really just seeking to be the sole recipient of his inheritance. In 2014, famed British singer and actor Cliff Richard was accused of child SA by four men, but he too was exonerated after one of the claimants was found to have threatened to make claims up against him unless he paid said claimant to keep quiet. The case resulted in the BBC being forced to pay Richard two million pounds in damages for reporting on the story. It's not just women who do this. Men can do it as well when they believe they have something financial to gain in making a false accusation. Spurned lovers or prospective lovers, such as in the tale of Potiphar's wife, are also often motivated, out of anger or unrequited love, to make false claims, as was the case with a New Zealander woman who was found guilty of making false claims against three male friends in 1996 and admitted that she filed the reports as revenge because one of the men had upset her by being unwilling to become involved in a permanent romantic relationship with her. She was seemingly so infuriated by his rejection, she not only falsely accused the guy that she was into, but dragged his two friends into the mud with her as well. Or in the case of Taya Melrose Cooper, who told police that she had been subjected to SA at knife point, only to change her story, admitting that she made the accusation because she disliked the accused men, following CCTV footage revealed that the alleged assault had not taken place. The reasons for filing a false complaint can be as trivial as a friend refusing to give you a ride home, as was the situation for Layla Ibrahim, who cut her hair clothing, and body with scissors before reporting her friends to the police, resulting in four men being held in custody for over 60 hours while their bodies were extensively examined if you catch my drift. Ultimately, Ibrahim, who was seven months pregnant at the time of her trial, received only three years in prison for her false claims. And speaking of pregnancy, child custody issues are also rife with false claims of abuse for the purpose of harming the former partner by depriving them of their parental rights that I'm not even sure it's worth belaboring. Get it? Such a topic by going into it in more detail. So let's just leave it at this report on alleged rates of incest and SA in custody disputes from Green 1991, who concluded that between 35% to 95% of such allegations are unfounded. The final motive that I believe produces the most ire in the public upon being proven false is attention-seeking, such as was the case for Natasha Statesman West, who claimed she was forced into a car and assaulted, but inevitably confessed 
that she had made the story up because she just liked the attention. What makes this motive perhaps of more concern than the others is that it seems to come with an element of social contagion. As for example, within a week of a 45-year-old Kiwi woman reporting to the police that she had been assaulted, a 25-year-old neighbor made the same claim, which was later dropped after having been determined to be false. It seems then that if you want attention, money, revenge, or love and can't seem to obtain it, then making a false claim of abuse is certainly one way that some people will attempt to gain it. Going back to Canaan, 1994, several rationales were provided by the women who admitted to their false claims, the most common of which, present in 27 or 56% of the cases, was providing an alibi, which in most instances was to cover up for infidelity or fears of pregnancy, such as one woman who claimed that she had been violated because she had unprotected sex with another man while her husband was overseas, and she knew she could not pretend, had she become pregnant, that the child was his. Only three cases in this category were not motivated by fears of being ousted for unfaithfulness. In one, a 25-year-old woman got into a drunken brawl with a man shortly before a custody hearing and claimed that he had SA'd her out of fear the drunken fight would harm her case. In the second scenario, a 16-year-old girl was drinking with two male friends, had sex with one of them, and then later that evening invited two other male friends over to her house, at which point her partner bragged about having bedded her, and in fear that others at her school would gossip, she ran to her friends to claim that it had been an assault. In the third, and one I'm gonna have to censor, and if it's something that I'm censoring in a video about this topic, you know it's bad. And in this case, it's the N-word. Warning. For viewers sensitive to issues of race, be advised that the following piece contains gratuitous use of the N-word. And by N-word, I mean... There, I said it. Anyway, in the third, a 37-year-old woman who was concerned that her boyfriend had given her an STI, yet felt she needed an excuse to go ask to be checked by a doctor, reported instead to the police that she had been, quote, I'm not saying that. I don't think I've ever seen that word published in an academic paper, but uh, I guess 1994 sure was a different time now, wasn't it? Twelve cases representing 27% of the total were determined to be motivated by revenge, because the woman had been rejected by a man that she was interested in or spurned by an ex-lover. Cannon provide three specific reports. In the first, a 19-year-old had been sleeping with a boarder at her mother's house, and upon being discovered, he was asked to move out. When she asked him for one last roll in the hay, he said, who the hell wants you? At which point she accused him of assault, admitting to the truth under polygraph assessment. In the second, a 17-year-old living in a group home claimed that she had been violated by a parent at said home, only to later admit, also under polygraph, that she was sexually interested in the man and made the claim to, quote, get even with him after he rejected her advances. In the third instance, a 16-year-old accused her ex-boyfriend because he had started seeing another girl and she wanted to, quote, get him in trouble. Eight cases representing 18% of the sample, and perhaps the most egregious category of false claims, were those made solely for the purpose of gaining attention or sympathy. In the first, a 17-year-old girl smoked marijuana with a man and then had intercourse with him. Afterwards, she told her friends that he had SA'd her, and her friends reported the man to the police, at which time she admitted that she made it all up for attention from her friends. Another 17-year-old told her mother that she was assaulted just so that her mother would stop criticizing her for being lazy. In a third instance, a 41-year-old divorcee alleged that her post-divorce counselor had violated her because she liked him and wanted more attention from him, admitting to lying under polygraph. And with that, I think we have a pretty good idea as to why some women will make false allegations of SA. For attention, for revenge, or as an alibi, typically for cheating in the majority of cases. It does happen. And the reasons why people do it are usually pretty calculated. Not an honest mistake or a misunderstanding resulting from a night of drunken sex or even mental illness, which also do play a role. But no, sometimes women will just accuse men of assault because they are ashamed, because they are angry, or because they want attention. And with all of that in mind, Let's come to a few conclusions.
There are a variety of reasons for which one may make a false report, and do, in fact, do so not infrequently, or at least not so infrequently as the commonly touted 2% statistic would lead one to believe, as somewhere between 8 and 41% of claims of SA are either demonstrable lies or have so little evidence as to be unactionable in court. The contention that false allegations never happen or happen so rarely as to be written off as a once-in-a-lifetime aberration is clearly not representative of reality because, yes, some women are just bad people. Some women find themselves in circumstances where they believe that making such an allegation will help them either gain something in society, be it sympathy or attention, or because they are ashamed and want to cover up infidelity or sex acts that they later regret. At the same time, there are women who are real victims of a crime and yet will not report their abuser because they are afraid of further victimization or have been coerced or intimidated to stay quiet. Both things can be and are true at the same time. And that, I believe, is the key takeaway from these findings. Of course, I am not saying that all women who claim to have been the victims of SA are lying. That's absurd. But in the same breath, to claim that no or almost no women ever make false reports is equally as absurd. The purpose of this video is not to denigrate survivors of SA, but to shed a spotlight on those who use victimhood and the goodwill of others as a weapon, and in doing so, cause the public writ large to be increasingly skeptical of claims of assault. There are two groups harmed by false allegations, the accused who often have their lives ruined even after being exonerated due to the nature of the claims, and actual victims, those whose real trauma is diminished by the very existence of false claims. This is not relegated to the issue of SA, of course. People lie about being victims all the time for all types of crimes. It's an unfortunate reality of society. The solution, however, is not to pretend that false reporting doesn't happen, because clearly it does, and it happens far more commonly than in 2% of cases. The solution is to be honest about the existence of false reporting, not to lie or obfuscate the statistical data because it makes you feel uncomfortable or doesn't suit your political agenda. The solution always is to tell the truth, because only the truth can be used as a lodestar by which to guide any true social change, aid victims, and protect the falsely accused from life ruination. But hey, what do you guys think? Do you think that the 2% statistic is a fair way of describing the prevalence of false allegations? Because it very well may be on the low end of the reporting, if not 2%, then what do you think the rates of false report really are? Are there any other reasons for false reporting that the researchers didn't identify here? Do you personally have any experiences with false report? Let me know in the comments down below, not only because I'm genuinely interested, but because it does help this video in the YouTube algorithm so that it will get recommended to other people. While you're down there, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like, and if you really enjoyed the content, subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed for more social science content, which, as you can probably imagine, takes a long time to produce. I'm a one-woman team doing all of the research, writing, recording, and editing, so yeah, takes a while to complete a project like this. But if you would like to see more from me, I do a weekly news and politics podcast with my co-host Spoon every Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. GMT, 3.30 p.m. EST on the Broken Crown channel, linked below. I also play a Pathfinder first edition game on that channel every Tuesday with some friends, including fellow YouTubers, Kami Mark and single player Carl at 7.30 p.m. GMT, 2.30 p.m. EST. Similarly, I play a D&D fifth edition game on Thursdays over on Geeks and Gamers Tabletop with Extra Girl, Epic Mike, Comics Division, and Dispro, DM'd by Eridai at 6 p.m. GNT, 1 p.m. EST. If you would like to support my work, you can do so by becoming a member of my Patreon or Subscribestar, linked below to see your name listed at the end of every video, along with these fine folks here, and get access to my Discord where I preview these videos before they go live, and just join our little social science community. If you want something more tangible for your support, you can check out my merch store, again, down in the description. And finally, thank you all so much for watching this rather troubling video. And as always, dear friends, all ton of volt.